All right. Hey guys, welcome to Mercy Hill. Excited that you're here today. We're going to be continuing our series and the master's plan. So if you have a copy of scripture, you can take it out and turn with me to the book of John. We're going to be in John chapter four as we are marching through these different kind of stories we see in the life of Jesus. And we're able to see how we need to be a people uh, who kind of share as Jesus shared. All right. Uh, Today, what we're going to see is much like last week. If you were here, I know a lot of people were kind of coming and going spring breaks and all of that. But if you were here last week, we talked about a guy named Nicodemus who Jesus used a very striking analogy with uh, about rebirth. Today is another striking analogy as Jesus draws upon our physical need for water and tells us that our souls are thirsty uh, for the living water in the way that our bodies thirst after physical water. Okay, so uh, I thought it would be really apt to kind of think through the the, uh, introduction to this sermon, getting us thinking about thirst and water. Um, If you've ever been thirsty before, you probably really, really remember it, you know? Like if you've ever been really, really thirsty before, it's something that kind of gets in your mind. I thought about different levels of this. You know, you think about being a kid and uh, and nobody tells you about hydration and you just run till you drop, right? You remember this being a kid and now you're maybe out at recess or something like that. And I have like distinct memories of you're sitting in that little line, that recess line, getting your, you know, you're waiting for your little five seconds at the water fountain. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, that is like life to you is if you could just get uh, to the water fountain or maybe you get older, you're an athlete, maybe you're a runner or a ball player and you get caught in a game or a situation where you really need water, but you just can't uh, stop at that moment and how thirsty it is. Or maybe it's a life or death situation. I remember uh, reading a bunch of different bios. I got into a kick on this one time about, uh, about some World War II guys that, you know, were downed over the Pacific. And um, many times the, the thing that they will remember through all of the war, the thing that they will remember most is being thirsty while being surrounded by the ocean, you know, that there's water all around so much so that even knowing that sipping from the ocean will, will only hasten and make them thirstier. Many of them succumb to the temptation to do that uh, because of how thirsty they are. Our bodies are built for thirst, right? I mean, they just are. We thirst after water. It is a a, a life-giving kind of quenching thing when water comes into our life. Jesus uses that, seizes upon that to tell us that, hey, there is a common experience that humans have when it comes to water and being physically thirsty. It's no different from our souls. Our souls are thirsty for the divine, and we will be on a search to quench that thirst, whether we go to God for that or whether we go to the world for that. Uh, That's what we're going to talk about today. But we will search to have that thirst quenched in our lives. Y'all, we are built for desire. We are built to search. We are built to to think about the things that will quench that thirst that we have. Um, But many times, this is what we're going to see today, the woman at the well. Many times, y'all, we end up go into a worldly well thinking that it will satisfy a divine thirst and it will never satisfy. It will only leave us thirstier with diminishing returns again and again and again. Uh, If we go to the world instead of going to the living water, you know what it'd be like? It'd be like a kid who has played till he's about dropped or somebody on one of those life rafts that is so thirsty they're about to fall over and instead of grabbing for water, they grab a bottle of syrup and just down it. How disgusting is that? Wouldn't that be gross? I mean, you just down a bottle of syrup. No, you're a desert wanderer about to fall out and instead of grabbing for water, you end up grabbing for a chocolate mocha peppermint milkshake, okay? It's like, no, that's not what I need. That will not quench what's going on with me. Yeah, it comes in a cup and there is a straw, okay? But it's not a divinely satisfying thing that I am thirsting for. That's what Jesus is gonna show us today, that many of us will grab for things like a syrup instead of the living water. The world will leave us thirstier than, it, uh, than we were before while the living water can actually satisfy. Here's the point this morning. Thirsty souls are only satisfied satisfied with one thing. Thirsty souls are satisfied with that living water. Are you on a search today? Are you wondering today? Are you moving from hobby to hobby to hobby? Are you moving from cause to cause to cause? From sexual relationship to dating relationship, different marriages? Are you searching for something? We have all been there. Our soul thirst causes us to search, but we 
will never be rest, uh, we will never rest until we find our rest in the one who is actually divinely going to meet that thirst and, uh, and be a thirst quencher. Listen, success, uh, hobbies, vacation, money, these things are not soul thirst quenchers, okay? They might, for a, they might for a season, but the psalmist tells us that they will turn to ash in our mouth. We need something else that will quench that thirst. And then ironically, it actually gives us the freedom to be able to pursue these other things uh, in the right way as well. Okay, here's what, that's another sermon for another day. Let's get into this one. Here's what we're gonna do. John chapter four, uh, let's dive in. We're gonna start in verse seven. It's real simple. Jesus is tired. He's walking through Samaria. He sits down at a well and here we go. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Two things. I'm not just from Samaria. I'm a woman from Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, Jesus sits down at this well. I want you to think, 2,000 years ago, the well is a social place. They're sitting at the Starbucks of their time, okay? So they're sitting there at the well, and, uh, and, and the, the woman comes up, and, and Jesus starts talking to her. We see no problem with that. We're like, so what? He's asking for a drink. Or whatever. Oh no. 2,000 years ago, this would have been very unusual. Why? Two reasons. She said them both. Number one, she's a woman. And as a class, the men of the Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish men at the time were fairly sexist. Okay. They would have been people who looked down on women. They wouldn't have thought it proper to speak to a woman in any real situation. There is uh, rabbinic tradition and things that we know of that, that talk about how the men at the time wouldn't even talk to their wives if it was in a public place. They thought it was degrading to them. Okay. So that was just, I mean, that's not right, but it just is. That was sort of the time uh, that they lived in. The second thing, though, is that the woman was a Samaritan. There was major racial beef between the Jews and the Samaritans. It mostly flowed downhill. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a group of people that had been left over from the exile in the 700s. They had intermarried, okay? They had taken on beliefs uh, of the culture around them, and the Jews kind of looked at them as a half people. They looked at them as people who believed wrongly, uh, who didn't do the right things and all of that. The Samaritans were highly syncretized, we call that. What that means is they had a lot of the truth, but they had a lot of other things mixed in with it, okay? So, I mean, I've been a lot of places in the world where this happens. I remember one time we were talking to a guy in Peru and they were kind of sharing the gospel message as he understood it. And what he was saying was, Actually, it was a woman. We were hearing it secondhand. What she was saying was uh, she was giving the gospel message. Sounded great. Jesus came, uh, was going to the cross for our sin, crucified. And then right at the point where you and I would expect Jesus to die in the story, she says he's on the cross. And then guess what? He turns into a lamb and flies to heaven. The end. It's like, man, I don't remember it quite like that, right? I, I mean, I, I know the story. I don't think that's how, that's what syncretism is. That's where the Samaritans were. It's not that they had it all wrong, but there was a lot of things that were were mixed in and for that rather than having compassion on them and trying to teach them the truth right the Jews kind of just looked down on them called them a half people now this is what I want you to hear just for a moment can I step aside for just one moment talking about bringing up sexism and racism let me let me bring up one thing that's not the main point of the whole story okay it's not I've already given you that but let me let me step aside for one minute and say this if you're a Christian especially if you are a Christian that is part of the majority culture wherever you are okay if you are part of the majority culture and a Christian I know this hit me and I think maybe it will hit you I want you to understand in this story Jesus is not offended over the assumptions that are being made about him okay think about it she said you can't talk to me you're a Jew well what does that mean well you're sexist and you're a racist I can't believe that you would talk to me tacitly she is throwing him into that camp and it was striking to me that Jesus doesn't take the bait Jesus doesn't react you know what he does in understanding, and this is, if you're, especially if you're in the majority culture, I think we could, we could stand to learn from this. Jesus probably knows that this woman has lived with assumptions being made about her for her whole life, right? He cannot hit the roof the one time somebody makes an assumption about him. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't try to correct. I'm not saying he doesn't try to go in with truth, okay? But he doesn't immediately go, oh, here we go, you know? He doesn't immediately say, oh, that, oh, oh now I'm a racist and, and walk away or whatever. No. 
He lets it ride. He just sort of lets it roll for a moment so that he can continue to lead with relationship. And I think that's a very, very good lesson for us. If we hit the roof because somebody has made an assumption about us, then we lose our opportunity for relationship with them. It doesn't take Jesus long to break down this barrier to get into this woman's heart and to be able to see fruit uh, there. It doesn't take him long. All it took for him is to not react the first time that the bait got thrown, okay? Now I think about this. Let Let me just talk to the Christians. Too. I know that's not where everybody is. I hear assumptions about Christianity all of the time. And I, I'm going to tell you how I try to handle it, okay? But for complementarian theology, people say, oh, you're sexist, right? I hear things about um, poverty, you know, and it's like, oh, the church doesn't care. Or even, even racism, things like that, getting lobbed at the church all the time. And you know what I think to myself? What I try to do the first thing when an assumption is kind of made about me because I'm a Christian, I try to think, you know, there's probably a reason why you're assuming that. It might be a historical reason. It might be something that you got burned in a church early in your life. It might be because you have seen racism or sexism or whatever in church world before. Okay, I, I, I'm not going to just hit the roof because there is some reason in your background for that. I'm going to try to show you why that's actually inaccurate of the true church, the invisible church. There's a whole lot of people that go to church. There's really one true church of Jesus Christ. And I want to be an ambassador for that true church in the situation that I'm in. And I hope maybe that uh, hits you where you are. Let's not react. Let's think about Jesus here, man, he, he, he leads with relationship, leads with a point of connection, and he's able to do that and get right into her life. And I think we lose an opportunity if we get so offended immediately when somebody has made a bit of an assumption about us, all right? Look at verse 10. Jesus answered her, and this, I'm going I'm to read this whole thing, so it's a little bit long, just kind of bear with me, try to stick with it in your mind. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? I mean, you know what she's saying here, just by the way, what she's saying is you don't have a pot and surely you're not going to drink from mine. Okay. Because if you drink from mine, you become unclean. She doesn't realize that in the gospel, Jesus doesn't become unclean. He makes people clean. Now she's going to realize that uh, here in just a few minutes. Okay. But she don't get that now. She's still trying to get all this in her mind. Are you greater than our father, Jacob? Uh, He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. She's doing the same thing Nicodemus did, right? She She understands exactly what he's saying and has no idea what he's saying. Okay. She's like, man, I don't get it. What are you talking about? Living water. But I got to come to the well again. Jesus says to her, he's going to get her to see it. This is the moment where the blinders come off. Okay. This is the moment he says, okay, go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered him. I have no husband. She said to her, uh, he, Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Uh Oh, this is getting deep. Okay. This ain't the type of real Starbucks conversation that goes on. Now we're reading each other's mail here. I mean, she, he knows what's going on in her life, right? And he's able to speak right into it. He wants the blinders to come off. He's trying to get her to see. I'm not talking about putting a spring here that you can come and drink physically from. What I'm trying to get you to see is that there is a wellspring of life that I have come to give you. And the only way that I'm going to get you there is to get you to see firsthand right in front of your face that you're going to a worldly well for divine salvation and that will never work. Not after one husband, two husbands, three husbands, you see. It will leave you thirstier and thirstier and thirstier, and I have come to give you something else. Now, let's kind of break all this all the way down. Now, first, he's talking about the living water, okay? Well, what is the living water? I have wrestled with this, trying to figure out exactly how to explain it. This is my best shot. Living water is salvation, okay? Living water is the unification with Christ. Living water is your rebirth. The Bible says that we become reborn, we become new. The Bible is, the, the, the living water is the spirit of God that is inside of you. The, the living water, this is probably the best way to think about it, is uh, the heart of stone coming out. The heart that doesn't really, uh, you know, is not in tune with spiritual things and is not attuned to the Lord. And the heart of flesh being put in. That is what the living water is, okay? It's us becoming new. Now, here's what the Bible is getting at. This is what Jesus is going to get at. 
What he's going to say is, I need to put a new wellspring in you that will eternally satisfy this search that you have that's sending you all over the world, all over creation, looking for a bunch of things in the world to, uh, to satisfy a divine longing. I need to put a new wellspring in you. I want to contrast that. If he says, I'm going to put a new wellspring in you that will flow, that's a lot different than saying, I'm going to come and clean up the river of your life. Okay? Two different things. Jesus didn't come to make us better. He came to make us new. He didn't come to clean the river. He came to give us a new spring. What do you think about it? If I said to you, if I said, hey, I need you to go clean up this river and be in charge of the construction project to clean this river up. None of us are engineers for river construction or whatever. The first thing we would say, though, is where does the pollution start, right? Because wherever the pollution starts, I'm not going to start cleaning before that. Like, I'm going to get up behind that, and then we're going to start working our way down because that's the only way that we can actually get this river clean. We all know that intuitively. You know, I was on a, uh, I was on a canoe trip one time. I was 14 or 15 years old, and living in Florida, rivers everywhere. It was really fun. We, that was kind of what our youth group did together. And uh, we went out and uh, we were on this big river, Swanee River. The, the, the trip was supposed to take four hours, okay? By about 10 hours in, we knew there was a major, major problem uh, with, the, with the trip. Somebody had gotten bad information. This is pre-GPS cell phone days, okay? So uh, somebody had gotten bad information and, and we were kind of going down the river and we thought there was a takeout point. I mean, we're, about, we're on this river all day long. Well, we had brought exactly enough water for about four hours. Now we're dying of thirst. They put all the senior high guys, okay, that was us, in the back of these boats, and they're like, we have got to get it. We're, it's about to get dark. we got to get off this river. I mean, some of us just felt like we were drained, dying. And so here's what happened. This is just the fact, and then nobody got real sick from this. I don't know how, but we ended up having to, I mean, we were so thirsty that what we would do is we would jump out of the boat, some of us that were just dying, like trying to, trying to get it, really exerting a lot of energy, we would jump out of the boat when we would see a spring in, in the river. We could see where it was coming up. We could see where the water was coming up. And we would dive all the way down. And I'm talking about putting our mouth just about on the bottom of that river and start drinking the water uh, right out of the spring from the Suwannee River. That is so nasty now that I think about it. I mean, when you just think about it, right? But what, what do we do? And, I mean, even at 15 years old, we fully understood, okay, the less pollution is going to be if I can get right down there by the spring, Right? If I can get all the way down right where it's coming out, that's probably my safest bet. We all knew that. Now, here's the problem. What the Bible teaches is that it is our heart that is the fountain of wickedness, evil, and sin. How do you get away from that? The heart is the spring. The spring is deceitfully wicked. Okay, so if I say to you, hey, go clean up your life, and you say, well, i got to get above where the uh, pollution is. Well, what if the pollution is in the spring, what if a pollution is actually in the well itself? That's why Jesus is saying to her, I need to come into your life and not, and not clean the river up. I need to come into your life and put a new wellspring inside of you. That is the way that you don't become better. You become new. And when that happens, it will quench the soul thirst that you have, and it will give you a proper relationship with things like success and accomplishment and achievement and acceptance and security and love and sex and marriage. It'll give you a proper relationship with those things rather than you starting to go to them because you think that those things will satisfy a longing that is inside of you. What Jesus is trying to get her to see is sex and relationships are not living water, nor is anything else that we could go to in the world, okay? They're not living water. They're good things. They're not divine things in terms of satisfaction, love, and acceptance, affirmation, beauty. We got to go to God to get those things, and then we can have a proper relationship with everything else. But if we are going to success, going to accomplishment, going to the well of sex and marriage and relationships over and over and over, you might as well be in a life raft thinking about sipping that salt water or a kid in the desert chugging a bottle of syrup, okay? It's, it's, maybe it'll satisfy you for one second. That, the psalmist tells us that. I mean, it's, it's pleasurable for a season, but there is going to be a time when that sin turns to ash in our mouth, leaves us thirstier than before. Well, you know, we're not going to go through this whole story. I don't have time, but here's what ends up happening. Uh, she, they keep going back and forth, and she's starting to, the, the veil is coming off, and she's starting to realize this dude is the son of God. This guy is the Messiah. Look at verse 25, skip down. The woman says to him, I know the Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus says to her, I who, I who speak to you am he. You know what it actually says here literally? You know what it says? There's no he, okay? There's no he in the, uh, uh, th that article doesn't exist here. What Jesus literally says to her is, I am, okay? 
I am the one, the one you speak about, I am. He is showing her, I am the prophet, I am the Messiah, I am the Son of God, I am the one who has come to make you new. And we're going to see this later right at the end. Y'all, she believes, she runs, she calls to all everybody she knows, you got to come see this guy, and there is much fruit in her life, all right? I got three things I want to show you about the living water today. The first one is this, the living water is given only to the thirsty. Now, we are all thirsty, okay? I don't think you can be a human without being thirsty. But what I mean by this is the living water is only given to those who realize that their soul's thirst can't be quenched but one way, and that is through the divine living water. We are all thirsty, we are all searching, we are all wondering. Uh, If you've heard me talk about this at Mercy Hill, you'll hear it a dozen more times if you continue to listen to my preaching. Genesis chapter 3, what did we lose in the garden when we sinned? When humanity sinned, our covering was gone. Why were the people unclothed when they were in the garden? Because they were fully clothed in God's love and his acceptance. They were secure in him. When sin comes in, they are immediately exposed. There is a void that is left in their life, and they are searching, they are running, they are covering. We all run, we all search, okay? And when we don't go to the Lord, Blaise Pascal said it like this, there is a void in our hearts that can only be filled one way. It's God-shaped. Now, we might start to jam other things into it to become whole and to feel like we're secure in the world, but there is a void in us that can only be satisfied one way. But when we don't realize that, we will go to the well of the world thinking that it's going to give us that divine living water. The wrong well will never give us the right water. But we keep going to that wrong well over and over and over, and this is what happens. You know what happens? One pastor said it like this. The, the, the tell for if we're going to the wrong well is when you get wind syndrome. I never heard this before. You ever had wind syndrome? When I have more money, <laughs> right? When I get that promotion. When I get married, when my kids, uh, when I have kids, when my kids accomplish things, okay, when I have more friends, when, 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 when we are looking to the world for divine satisfaction, we end up having win syndrome. It can be about money. It can be about accomplishment in her life. It is more about sex, marriage, uh, relationships. Maybe that's sort of where you are that we think if I just find, when I find the right, then I'm going to be okay. It's going to a worldly well thinking that we are going to satisfy a divine thirst, drinking syrup, drinking salt water. It'll make you thirstier and thirstier and thirstier. We will never get soul satisfaction from a worldly well. They are cheap imitations, okay? I can prove it to you, all right? I can prove it to you. Uh, think, think about this. If in our so- sex in, in our society, I mean, is just so idolized, I mean, you think about it. There is such starvation for it. There is such, man, people are going to all the different wells they can uh, to satisfy something in them. C.S. Lewis talked about it like this. He said, if you looked at a culture, thinking about food, he said, if you looked at a culture, and here's what you said, they would have massive arenas. People would pay money to get a show. And all that was going to happen is people would pack and they would wait and there was such a demand and somebody would walk out with a dish and uncover it and it would be steak and potatoes, okay? This is my, uh, this is my interpretation of C.S. Lewis, okay? So you got the steak and potatoes right here. He said, if people were paying money just to get a look at that, you would know that that, that, that society is starving to death, okay? That would be the sign that they're starving for something, In our society, you think about sexuality, you think about the starving nature, but here's what the world says, that getting more will satisfy you. No, getting more and more and more. Pornography gets more prevalent and weirder, okay? Fifty Shades of Grey books uh, sell more copies. They get more author contracts. You end up having more uh, no-fault divorce. Let me get another husband and trade This and for that, you have all of these different things that are going on in our society. A new app comes out every single day designed for casual sexual encounters. These things would be getting less, not more, if sex was actually satisfying. You understand? Think about it like this. Tim Keller said this. Continued thirst is not an argument for a lifestyle. It is an argument against the lifestyle. Okay, these things would be getting more diminished if they were actually satisfied, satisfying, but instead they get stronger, more prevalent, crazier and crazier. Why? Because it's sipping syrup, it's salt water. It makes us thirstier and thirstier and thirstier. It's an imitation. 
It's the world saying this will give you soul satisfaction and it will not. It was never created to. You think about other things. Think about happiness and joy, okay? Man, is this the what? Think about the ways that we try to scratch that itch of satisfaction, joy, happiness in our life. Is it a well that actually satisfies? It's not. Man, people are on one vacation already planning their next one. <laughs> they know they've got, they know that, well, this is great. We're going to have to do this again to try to, you know, kind of get, we're going to have to go back to that well. We're going to have to go back to that well. And there's always something else that's coming out. Whatever we have materially, vehicle, car, it's never good enough. Got to trade this one in so that we can get another one. Whatever's coming out in terms of hobbies or, you know, I thought about our, our student ministry. You know, the, all the rave right now from about, I don't know, 10 years old up through early college is a game called Fortnite. Okay, some of y'all, I looked in the early service, some people's eyes just immediately dropped. Okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm not attacking it. It's not an attack. All I'm saying is that whatever the latest craze is, there'll be another craze. There'll be another one. It'll, it'll keep coming. Why? Because these are not divinely satisfying. If they were, there'd be less, not more. But there's more all the time because we go to these things and we don't have a proper, none of them are bad, all right? But we don't have a proper relationship with them because we're trying to use them for something that only we can get as a soul satisfaction in the Lord. I thought about this in my life. Let me give you one that I, I man, I'm just seeing right now firsthand. This is as real as it gets, okay? My kids now are starting to play sports and I was an athlete growing up. And I, and man, I realize, I fully understand the trap of they got to have the best gear. Man, they got to be on the best team. We got to be there every day. It's going to dominate our life. Why? Is it even really about them? Or could it be that it's about me? That I want to be, that acceptance is a well that I want to go to. That approval is a well that I want to go to. And I want to look well in other parents' eyes. And I want to be able to brag on my kids in front of my friends or whatever it is. I think about if I stay on that hamster wheel, where will that end? Because there's always another mountain they could conquer. There's always another accomplishment that they could do. You see, it will be a well that I keep having to go to over and over and over. Beauty, love, security, joy. These things were meant to be given in a divine way. And you don't go to the worldly well to think that we're going to get divine satisfaction. Might as well be sipping salt water or drinking out of a bottle of syrup, okay? So let me ask you this, and then I'm going to move on. Have you come to that place in your life yet? Have you come to that place where you realize Man, the world will not satisfy. That I will continue to chase and continue to chase and continue to chase. And you know what will happen? Either you'll keep chasing all the way to the end or one day you'll pr become pretty cynical when you actually realize. Man, you, maybe you get, gain some success. Why are so many people that have it all the ones that are deeply depressed, suicidal and all that? Because they've realized, like the book of Ecclesiastes says, that it really is all vanity. That I can chase and chase and chase, but there is a hole in me that will never be fixed by going to the world for my living water. The world doesn't give us that living water. Jesus gives us that living water. Secondly, I want to show you this. The living water is freely given, okay? It is given to the thirsty, number one, but number two, it's free. Here's what I mean. Jesus doesn't say to her, oh, you do this and I'll reward you with the living water. Nope. He doesn't say you work really hard, you be super moral, and then I can give you a blessing of the living water. You don't earn it. It's not a reward. It is freely given. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you that living water. Three times in one verse, it's either gift, give, or given. It is received we cannot work for what Jesus is giving us. We've got to allow him to, uh, we've got to allow him to give us this living water to put it inside of us, okay? It's not something that we can earn. It's going to be given. You know, last week we talked about Nicodemus. And I know, I know some of you were here. If you were here last week, many of you were here. Uh, man, forgive the recap. We had a lot of students on spring break and all that kind of stuff. So let me, let me just kind of recap it. Nicodemus was a moral guy. Upstanding, had the world by the tail. This is a dude that's going places. I mean, he's religious to the max. Everything in his life is in order. Some of you honestly could probably really identify with that. It was very hard for Nicodemus to understand that Jesus said to him, you got to be born again. And that's a gift that I give you. It's not something you can earn. Why? Because for the moral, religious, upstanding, wealthy, I've got the world by the tail person, it's hard for them to understand that Jesus didn't come to remodel you. He came to rebuild you. Okay. He came to take away what was there and put something new in its place. Why? Because we feel like maybe we've earned it. 
We feel like maybe we've done pretty good. We look down on other people that they feel like they're, maybe they need to be remodeled. Maybe they need to be reborn or whatever, but I can just kind of get by. No, Jesus had none of it last week. You need to be reborn. And that is something that I give you. Same thing here. He says, I don't come to clean up the river of your life. I come to give you a new spring. It's got to all be new. And it's something that I give you. You can't work for it. You know what I think when we, when we pull those two stories and put them side by side, John 3 and John chapter 4, here's what we learn insiders and outsiders both need the living water but for one of the groups it's a little easier to come by okay the insiders it's very hard they've got to come to that place where they realize I am as sinful I am more sinful than I could have ever imagined but more loved simultaneously than I ever dared hope they got to get to that place but man, for the outsider, they come in and maybe they already have a leg up because they're able to say, man, the works that I have done don't merit God's grace. The things in my life don't merit. You know what? You might be here today and here's what you might think. You might erroneously think you're the only one with an addiction issue. You might erroneously think that you're the only one going through a divorce or a second divorce. You might be the only one who thinks you have failed in these different areas of your life. Listen, that has always and has always been a great tactic of Satan. He wants to isolate you. That is not true. But you know what, the outsider, if you kind of feel like you're on the outside, you might be actually in a place today where you would say, I know I've got to get new. I know I can't get better. And I know there is nothing in my life that would merit God giving me a new wellspring of life. There is nothing that I can do. If that's where you are, congratulations, because you are where everybody's got to get. You are. You are where we all need to be. Because everybody who has ever come to Jesus Christ and has actually accepted him into their life, accepted him as Savior, repented of their sin, trusted him as Savior, trusted the newness of life, walked with him as Lord, everybody that has ever done that in the history of the world has had to come to the place where they realized me pulling myself up by my bootstraps tomorrow and being a better human don't get me no closer to the divine that I need somebody else to come in. I need to be unified with Christ. I need his blood to wash my sin away and I need his life to count for mine, not my life. Maybe you're there today and if you are, let me, show you, let me share the gospel with you in the best way that I can from this passage, okay? You know what we have in this passage? Jesus gives us the living water but he does so by giving us his very life, okay? He gives us the living water He's gonna put a new wellspring in you. He's gonna put the spirit of God in you. He's gonna unify you with himself so that when God looks upon you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees Jesus' victory. That's gonna happen, but it's only gonna happen if we put our faith in the, in, the, in the fact that Jesus Christ died for us, that he went to the cross for us. Now he tells the woman at the well, you need a wellspring of life. I'm telling you that today. You need a wellspring of life. But the author of John gives us clues as to how Jesus will give us the wellspring of life. It's not just that he tells her in this story, you need a living water. He actually foreshadows to us how it is that Jesus is going to give us that living water. Let me share it with you. In John chapter four, Jesus is exhausted. Jesus is thirsting to death. And Jesus is sitting there with the woman at the well at the sixth hour, exhausted, thirsty, sixth hour. Do you know the other place in the book of John where Jesus is exhausted, thirsty, and guess what time it is? John chapter 19, he's hanging exhausted on a cross. He cries out, I thirst, I am thirsty. And do you know what happens to be the time of day that it is? It is the sixth hour. John is trying to show us you only get the living water because Jesus Christ will give his life for you. Jesus tells this woman, I bring you a wellspring of life, but I only bring you this wellspring because I'm willing to let mine run dry. I'm gonna give you a new heart, but it's only gonna, gonna be because my heart will stop beating. Y'all, Jesus didn't condemn the woman at the well. Why? Because he knows I'm about to go to the cross. I'm gonna pay for the sin of the entire world, all your marriages, all the times that you've gone to the wrong well thinking you're gonna get the right water. I am going to pay for all of that on the cross. And if you will just come and put your faith in me, I'm going to pay for your sin with my blood. Think about this. Well, whose well, whose well was it they were sitting at? Do you remember when we were reading it? Whose well was it? It was Jacob's well. Jacob bought the land for this well in Genesis chapter 33. Think about the connection. Jesus is the true and better Jacob. Jacob buys a well with his money to water his family. Jesus bought a well with his blood that he might make us his family. This is what Christ has done for you. This is what Christ has done for me. 
that on the cross his death can count as our death. Our sin deserves death. Jesus took death on the cross. Our sin deserves that we are separated from God. Jesus was separated from God on our behalf. But in his resurrection, he extends his hand and says, come join me in the newness of life. He lived the life that we didn't live. He died the death that we deserved. And in his resurrection, we have the opportunity for the newness of life so that he can say to us today, and I can say to you from John chapter 7, whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Do you want that today? Some of you in here today need to just flat out become a Christian right now, okay? I'm talking about we don't have to have the music and the lights and the whole deal. You can become a believer right now. What does it take? It takes repenting of your sin, knowing, man, I have sinned. I have fallen egregiously before God. You say to God right now in your heart, I repent of that sin. Jesus, I know on the cross you paid the penalty that I was deserving of me. I owed that, and you paid that death penalty for me. And I believe that in the resurrection, you are the firstborn of all creation, that I am joined with you, and now we will live for eternity, and I will trust you as the Lord of my life. And you're becoming a believer. I pray that many of you might step over that line today, or if you have stepped over that line in the last few months here at Mercy Hill. You know, at Mercy Hill, we don't do a lot of, hey, raise your hand if you got saved today. We do a lot of come forward and get baptized if you got saved today, right? We do a lot of the big boy step. Let's get in the water. Let's put on display for the world what Jesus Christ has done in our life. And you are going to have that opportunity over the first two weekends uh, in the month of April. We're baptizing on Easter, and then we're going to baptize as an echo because I believe God's going to drop a hammer on some people's heart on Easter, and they're going to need another shot to come and get baptized that next weekend. So we're baptizing those two weekends. I pray that some of you would be in that number. We're going to talk about how you can do that and the step for that. Uh, Man, we just, on Thursday night, Y'all preached as hard as we could here and our kids' ministry had five adults, a couple of kids that are gonna be getting baptized on Easter. I'm praying that number is dozens, if not more, and many of those could come right out of this service right now, okay? So if you're getting saved, if you're a believer, let's not rob God of his glory for what he's done in your life. Let's fill out this card here in a few minutes and let's get in that water together, all right? Let's do this. Third and final thing, really quick. Are we going and telling of the living water, okay? This is designed specifically for you who are bought in, Listen, remember, some of y'all, this is your first time. I'm not asking you to go tell anybody anything, okay? Uh, I'm not, okay? So this is for those of us that are sort of bought in and have been here. I want you to see what happens in this story. The woman left her water jar and went away into town, verse 28, and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? You know what's going on in this story? Jesus Christ puts a wellspring in her heart. That wellspring overflows and now she's watering into other people's lives that are around her. And that is the pattern for us. Christian, are you talking about the gospel? Are you telling people to come and see your savior? Are you inviting on Easter? Have you grabbed our inviter cards and going out, everybody you know, your relationships and trying to get people in the door so that they can hear of the resurrection on Easter? Some of you are new today. Maybe you're even with a friend that has invited you. Listen, you may never believe the gospel message, but I promise you this, you can know for sure if they're inviting you in, they love you. You may never believe. You might think we're all a bunch of loons, okay? And that's fine. You might think we're crazy. That's totally fine. What you can't deny is that they love you. They feel like they have found a treasure and they want to share it with you. You can't be offended by that, you know? You, you, can, you, you, you could be one who says, man, I, I don't believe, but you got to know they love you. It's not a notch on some belt. They're not trying to win you to something or whatever. They have found a treasure. They have found water. Their soul was thirsty, parched, and dry, and they found water. And they want you to see that water as well. But if you are a believer today, you know, you might, I've been hammering the motivation for three weeks. Because if we get the motivation right, people will go share. The overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. Are you in awe today over the fact that you were chasing the world, <laughs> parched, dry, thirsty, and that Jesus Christ has put a wellspring of water in you? If you are amazed over that, we will, like the woman at the well, go and tell people that we know. We will. Now, if that's where you are and you're finally like, man, I want to go tell, then you know what you need to do? There's two things I told you. Number one is tell them to come and see. We said that already. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. But if you need to sit down with somebody over a cup of coffee or sit down at lunch, sit down in a break room, and you want a real quick, easy way 
that you could share the gospel message with somebody, I want to give you one. You do what Jesus did. Jesus pointed out sin and he pointed to the Savior and that's what we do. We point out sin lovingly, okay, got to be careful there, all right? You want to point out sin in a loving way, realizing that you are a sinner first and the chief of sinners. You're not telling somebody else about what they've done wrong without realizing, man, I have been that where you are, maybe still where you are. Uh, that's got to be first, point out sin, point to a Savior. I learned this when I was six years old. I think it's still one of the best tools in the world. It's called the Romans Road. All right, there's a bunch of different variations of this. Three scriptures as clearly uh, share the gospel as we can. Three scriptures. Number one, uh, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sit down with somebody and you say, look, I sinned and you sinned. We all sin. Okay, uh, if people don't believe that they sin, take them, to, uh, take them to the Ten Commandments and say, hey, have you lived your life without ever breaking one of these? <laughs> right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's undeniable. We are sinners. We've all sinned. Well, what's the wages of that sin? Romans 6, 23, it's death. That means that there is uh, separation from God for eternity. But the gift of God is eternal life. What was the gift of God? The gift of God was Jesus on a cross, suspended between heaven and earth. He has come that we might look upon him and we might be saved and we uh, confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. That's Romans 10 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. That's a real quick resource. We're going to post that resource uh, this weekend. So you'll be able to grab that one, maybe jot those verses down, remember those, and have some gospel conversations. All right. The other thing I'll tell you is this you're interested in sharing the gospel? Three equipped seminars this year. They're all going to be the same seminar. Um, but me, pa me, Pastor Gary, Pastor David, our, our, uh, our campus pastors and myself are going to be co-teaching a, a, a class over all three of our equipped seminars about how to share your faith. Don't have to be the scariest thing. Let's share like Jesus did. Let's tell people that we have found a treasure. We want to equip you to do that. So I hope hundreds of people are going to go through that class over the course of the year. You can make your plans to do that. All right. Now, I've left myself a little bit of time here. I want to finish the sermon like this. Everybody here, they're doing this at the campuses as well right now. All right. Everybody get this card out right here. This is in the front of your seat. All right, it's right in front of you. If you're in the front row right here, guys, it's under your seat. Uh, the campus is under your seat if you're on the front row. Here's how we're going to close. We're going to close our service uh, by talking to two groups of the people, but we're all going to end up writing something down on this card, okay? You'll see on this Connect card, it's got a place for name, email, phone number. For some of you, and I'm going to talk to this group first, I want you to fill out that whole thing. This is the group that needs to fill this out and turn this in. If it's time, and you know that it's time, for you to give God his glory for what he has done in your life, and you need to be baptized those first two weekends of Easter, you need to fill this card out and put it in the offering bucket. Is this going to come by here in a few minutes? It is time, all right? The first First step of obedience for a believer is to tell the world what God has done in their life. Baptism is a wedding ring. That's what it is. You know, I could take this wedding ring off. It don't mean, actually, I can't take this wedding ring off. But if I could take this wedding ring off, then I would take it off. And I, I, that doesn't make me any less married. I understand the wedding ring doesn't make me married. But I'm going to tell you something, man. If I'm married and I'm excited about the treasure that I have found, who, she is a treasure in my wife, then I'm absolutely going to wear this ring and make sure people know Okay, that's what baptism is. It is an outward display of an inward reality. It doesn't save you, but boy, if you are saved, it would be hard to live as an unbaptized person because the Spirit of God will be convicting you of that all the time. God is telling us, go through the waters and put on display. I have never in my life met somebody who wrestled, 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 wrestled with the decision to get baptized, finally submits to it, uh, gets baptized, comes out of the water, and is like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I have never met somebody that does that. Everybody in my life I've ever seen that wrestle with this, when they got baptized, they said, man, I wish I would have done that earlier in my life and given God his glory for what he has done in my life. Bring God your obedience on Easter. You fill this card out. Man, if Satan's trying to convince you otherwise, no, all right? You fill this card out right now. You, or, or actually, in just a minute, you're gonna, we're all going to fill it out together. You're going to do name, email, phone number, we'll drop it in the offering on the way by. Hey, but listen, it's for everybody, okay, because some of us in here, you know somebody in your life that you're praying for. You know somebody in your life, family member, great friend of yours, whatever it is. Man, you know it's their name that needs to be here. They need to be the ones to hear of the resurrection. They need to be the ones that someday feel that divine satisfaction of Jesus watering their soul and them giving God their, their obedience, them giving God his glory for what he has done in their life. You know there's somebody in your life. You know what I want you to do? I want you to write their name right here. You don't need to fill out their phone number and all that. You probably already got it. But you can fill out their name. We're not going to turn this in. We're going to put this in our Bible. We're going to take this home. We're going to put it somewhere where we will remember to pray for that person. 
and we're going to pray that God will open a door, that we can invite them to come on Easter and hear about the resurrection. We're going to pray that God will open a door in their life and that he will save them. And we're going to do that faithfully. Whose name is God bringing to your heart? We're going to reflect on this in just a moment. Can you imagine the power of this moment? That you write somebody's name down and then you start praying for them over the next couple weeks. God opens the door. They come on Easter. And maybe it's not a watershed thing, but man, they begin to start getting hooked and Jesus begins to move in their life. And maybe it's six months from now, maybe it's a year from now, maybe it's two years from now. One day they come to you and they say, man, I've accepted Christ and I'm gonna get baptized. I gotta fill out one of those cards and you whip this thing out of your Bible and you say, no, I already got you one, bud. I already filled one out for you. I filled your card out two years ago in March at Mercy Hill and I've been praying for you every single week. Can you imagine the power of that moment? Some of you, there are people in your life where you love them that much. Would you do that for them? All right, we're gonna do this all together, okay? If you need to get baptized, you fill this out. The rest of us in here, man, who is it in your life that God is putting on your heart that you need to be faithful to invite, maybe to come to Easter and pray for them? Let's do this together. Campuses, we're all doing this as a one church together. Let's just reflect on this. Who is God bringing to your heart? And let's write a name down together. All right, let's, hey, let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done here this weekend. And God, we're praying for much fruit. Lord, I pray that we'll be faithful. But God, more than that right now, Lord, I want to pray over those in our congregation at all three campuses right now that are wrestling with filling this card out in order that they might get baptized those first couple weekends of Easter. Lord, they're becoming believers. They've been a believer. It's time for them to give you their obedience. And God, I pray that nothing would snatch that from them. God, they're going to have so much joy in it. Lord, I pray you would keep the enemy at bay right now. Lord, bind him. God, allow your spirit to reign and move and work. In Christ's name we pray, amen.